The grass withers, the flower fades. But the word of our God stands forever. The word of God, which also performs its work in you who believe. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and observe it. We are here this morning to study in the Word of God. We are studying in major Bible themes, major Bible themes, currently studying on salvation from the penalty of sin. If you do not have notes for our class today, Molly has some back in the back, and so if uh, you need notes, uh, just let her know and she'll bring them to you. Uh, We know that often, uh, sometimes you'll take the notes and then come back the next week and not have a set of notes. No worries, just let us know that you can... Use the notes and we'll get them to you. I appreciate Molly and her service of letting me know about the notes and handing them out. So I'm very thankful for her work of service. As we're going to talk about in our Bible verses for this week, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, 9, and 10. We'll talk about that at the end of the class. Well, before we jump in and study the material today on salvation from the penalty of sin, and again, we're resuming that study. We've already begun that study previously. We're going to resume that study today. Let's take a moment for silent prayer. We need to make sure that all of our scrambled thoughts from the things going on in our world around us uh, are put aside, that we're ready to quiet our mind and focus on the things that God has prepared for us today, and that we are indeed under the control and ministry of God the Holy Spirit, who is the one who leads us into all truth. Shall we pray? Most gracious Heavenly Father, the lesson that we're learning today is a tremendous blessing and you've given us a grace gift by allowing us to gather one more time. We showed up this morning and the building was still here, the power was still on, the, everything that we needed for us to be gathered today, the transportation we needed, the physical health we needed, everything that was needed was provided by you and we thank you for that. We ask that you would give us the the attention, the focus that we need in order to learn the lessons. Yes, we may be born-again believers in Jesus Christ, but it's important for us to understand what salvation is so that we might share the good news of the gospel of Christ with others around us. Father, we ask that you help us to focus, set aside distractions, give us the understanding we need so that these things might be written upon our souls, implanted there so that we might be able to live according to what we've learned. Father, we ask all these things in Jesus Christ's most precious and holy name. Amen. Well, we are in the middle of this. Uh, We've covered a lot of material so far, but we are in the middle of our study of this. If you will turn in your notes to the section on the three tenses of salvation, that's where we are now. If you uh, have not been here for the entire study, then uh, I welcome you to go to our website, I will take a moment to highlight that, by the way. Go to our, our website. If you go to the church's website, and by the way, I've had a couple of different people now who have reported problems with the website. I have yet to see them, so if you run into problems, please let me know. It may be that the, the company that hosts our website has been having some issues. And Are you guys still having trouble with it, or is it working okay now, or it's working now? Okay, anyway, but this, the website is a tremendous resource for you, for those who come to the church. Uh, all of the lessons are put up on the website. If you go to the Bible classes and then under Bible classes, you go to the class recordings, you'll see the primary page that comes up has the recent classes, which go back about a month or so. And you'll see that there's information in there about the classes that have been taught. But if you're just interested, for example, in catching up in major Bible themes, you can click on that. It's got all the documents for the class, all those PDFs over there, the documents from the class. And then you've got all of the classes that have been taught in major Bible themes, the first 86 lessons. And so you can go back and listen and get caught up on any of that. So please take advantage of the website. Tremendous resource. And so if you weren't here for the previous classes on this, you're welcome to go back and pick up those lessons off of the website. We have both MP3s. And there's screencasts up there. With the screencast, you can actually see uh, the slideshow while you're listening to the audio as well. 
Three tenses of salvation. This is what we were talking about last week. We'll do a review of the first two tenses because that's what we talked about last week. And then we'll go ahead and move forward by getting to the point three here, the future tense. That's why this is called the three tenses because from a believer's perspective, recognize this is from a believer's perspective. From a believer's perspective, there are three tenses of salvation. Past tense, present tense, future tense. In the past, as a born-again believer, in the past, you were saved from the penalty of sin. That is what we've looked at here in our Ephesians 2.8 passage, which I, have, I told you before. It says, um, for by grace you have been saved, past tense. For by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of work, so that no one may boast. So here we have the past tense completed in the past for you, wholly brought to completion. You are saved from the penalty of sin, and you will always be saved from the penalty of sin. We have future lessons, by the way, where we're going to study on two different aspects of salvation. Believe it or not, there's two different things, two different chapters in, in Chafer's book, and that's just what this is based on, is Lewis Berry Chafer's book on major Bible themes, Assurance of salvation and eternal security. So we want to be, we want to know, we want to be assured that we're saved, and that's important. But even beyond the assurance of our salvation, we want to know that we can't lose it, right? So those those two are future chapters coming. And by the way, uh, I'll take a little aside while I'm talking about that. Um, I've had a a change in in mind about how I'm going to approach upcoming lessons. I was going to jump straight from this into salvation grace blessings. I've actually decided to postpone the salvation grace blessings just a little bit. What we're going to do is when we finish this lesson on salvation from the penalty of sin, we're going to move on forward into salvation from the power of sin, which is the next chapter in Chafer. We're going to teach on that because those two things are critical for, for us to understand. So how we got saved from the penalty of sin and how we are on an ongoing basis saved from the power of sin. And then after we finish the chapter on salvation from the power of sin... We're going to come back and look at salvation, grace, blessings, which is a study of all the things that happen to us at the moment of our faith in Jesus Christ. So we're going to come back to that. And the reason why is I think, I'm convinced that in the church, the teaching on uh, salvation from the power of sin has been wholly lacking. And that includes in doctrinal churches as well, as you're going to see as we go through that. Many doctrinal churches have done a poor job uh, of teaching salvation from the power of sin and so we're going to go through and we're going to study that material next after this and then come back to salvation grace blessings that's the that's the timeline as i see it now anyway so salvation from the penalty of sin is referred to as being wholly brought to completion in the past at the moment of faith in jesus christ it is so perfect a work that it cannot be undone and we looked at all this previously romans 8 is a fantastic chapter in our bible it refers to both no condemnation at the beginning of the chapter and no separation at the end of the chapter. There is no condemnation now for those who are in Christ Jesus. If you're in Christ Jesus, you are not a condemned one. You are not a perishing one. You are a saved one, a one who has a life eternal in Christ. So that's Romans chapter 8. 1 John 5.13 also reminds us of that. It says, I write these things so that you may know that you have eternal life. As a born-again believer, you should know that you have eternal life. You should not be concerned that you can lose your salvation. And I'm convinced that that's a huge step in the life of a believer. Many, many, many believers spend their whole spiritual life treading water. That's what I call it, is treading water, because they're so concerned that they're going to do something and lose their salvation that that's all they're really focused on is how can I keep myself from going to hell you know, and it's very subtle how it happens, by the way. Many churches don't come out and teach that you can lose your salvation. But they'll say things like, if you don't straighten up the way you're heading, you're, you're on the road to hell. Well, if you're a believer, can you go to hell? The answer is no, you cannot. You will not go to hell because you're no longer a condemned one. But the fact of the matter is, many, teaches very, many churches very subtly teach the idea that you can lose your salvation, but you cannot. Second point for a believer... There is also present salvation, that's the present tense, salvation from the power of sin in the daily life. And we looked at that in Romans chapter 6, 
Romans chapter 8 and 1 John 1, 7. You are, as a born-again believer, you are given provision in your life that you might not sin. You have been empowered such that you might not sin. Old Testament saints, they had to try to obey the law in the power of the flesh because the Old Testament saints did not have the universal indwelling of the Spirit. Old Testament saints, let me say that again, Old Testament saints did not have the universal indwelling of the Spirit. Today, in, as members of the church, we have the indwelling of the Spirit for everyone who believes. All of us do. So we are empowered at a greater level than the Old Testament saints were. So now you have the ability to walk your walk in the power of the Spirit. They had to try to obey the law in the power of the flesh. In fact, that was the whole point of the law, was to show the Israelites that they could never live up to the righteous standards of God. They could not possibly do it. And, the, and then they should, should have, for the Israelites, it should have highlighted to them that they needed God's grace and they needed His strength. Well, today we have the indwelling Holy Spirit who can keep us from sinning in the first place. Beyond that, as we're going to study about in our next, I'm going to touch on this more when we get to the next class, which is on salvation from the power of sin. It's a whole, a whole lesson on the salvation from the power of sin. When we get to that, we are going to un- come to understand that God also provided for the inevitability that as fallen creatures, sinners saved by grace, we would stumble and we would fall. And God provided for that as well. And that is through the homologeo process. That is through uh, agreeing with God about our sins and the restoration to fellowship that comes from that. And we will study that. And we will spend some time talking about that word homologeo and what it means and the proper understanding of what uh, restoration to fellowship really involves. Now, this is what we looked at last time. We read through this, but we did not actually... Uh, gain any ground on this because we didn't go look at any of the scriptures for a believer there is also the promise of a future salvation from the very presence of sin as we are set free from this body of death and perfectly conformed to the image of god's son so let's take a look at this first of all promise of future salvation if you turn with me in your bibles to first peter chapter one verse five again if you are interested in first peter we have a bunch of lessons up on the website. I think it's over a hundred lessons now. You can go up and listen to on the book of First Peter. We're in chapter four, still wrapping up chapter four. And if you're interested in in uh, learning about First Peter, there's a lot of material up there, and uh, I think you'll be blessed by going through it. First Peter chapter one and verse three. I'm going to back up a couple of verses. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. Did you know that? As a born-again believer, there is an inheritance that is set aside and reserved for you. It is imperishable and undefiled. Uh, Earthly inheritances don't always work that way. Earthly inheritances can... Uh, you can you can think, wow, okay, so and so, my my aunt, so and so, my aunt uh, Tilly. I'm going to make up a name. Nobody has an aunt Tilly, do they? But anyway, my aunt Tilly, she's got a lot of money, and she's got me in her will, you know, and it's going to be great. And then when Aunt Tilly passes away, you come to find out that she uh, was duped by a bunch of telemarketers, and she spent all her money on nonsense, and there's nothing left in the estate, right? That's what happens to earthly inheritances, or uh, sometimes what, what you find out is that, that in the, at the 11th hour, Aunt Tilly decided to take you out of the will. And so now you don't get anything. So uh, these things happen. But in terms of a, our heavenly inheritance, it is something that is imperishable. It cannot be taken away. It's undefiled. It will not fade away. It is reserved in heaven for you. So when you, when you look at what is yet future for us and in our, when we finally depart these earthen vessels and we're in glory with our Savior Jesus Christ, there's an inheritance waiting for us. What a glorious thing that is to think about. An inheritance that's waiting for us, it's reserved for us, and it has absolutely nothing to do with your faithfulness or faithlessness. Nothing to do with that. So the inheritance is reserved for you, and it was reserved for you on the basis of who and what 
Christ is, right? The who and what Christ is. Now, there are rewards. The Bible also talks about rewards. And there are things that a believer can do in this lifetime that will cause us to accrue, if you will, rewards in heaven. And those are also mentioned in the Bible. Those are different from the inheritance because the inheritance is something that's utterly independent of your faithfulness. But rewards depend upon whether or not you actually walk in the light, honor God with your life, and bear the fruit of the Spirit. And we'll talk more, we'll talk more about that as we go through uh, major Bible themes. But the fact of the matter is there's an inheritance. Now we get to our verse here. It says, Who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Okay, well, what is that? What is that salvation? I've already been saved, and I am currently being saved. So what does this mean? I'm protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Well, I have a salvation yet future, and that is a salvation from the very presence of sin. Someday I will no longer be in this fallen body. I will no longer be in this body of death, body of pain, uh, this body of sin. Instead, I will receive a resurrection body. And that resurrection body is a spiritual body designed for someone who is no longer functioning in the, in the worldly realm, a spiritual body with that is one that's without sin. That is a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. I will also be taken up into glory. And now, if I died right now, if I fell over dead right now, you guys must think I'm morbid or something because I always talk about dying right during class. But if I fell over dead right here today, then I would immediately be in the presence of my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Absent from the body is at home with the Lord. That's a biblical premise. We are immediately in the presence of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in glory. But I would not receive my resurrection body. And there's faint little in our Bible that talks about this, but the little that we know is this idea that we're going to be clothed in robes. Uh, these robes are going to clothe us as we wait for our resurrection bodies. Now, one, those resurrection bodies will be received at the rapture event. At the rapture event, the dead in Christ shall rise first, and they will receive their resurrection bodies, and then those who are alive will be transformed in the twinkling of an eye, will join together with those who have risen, and will meet Christ in the air. That is when you receive your resurrection body. So if I were to die right now, I would be separated from this fallen body, from the very presence of sin, but I won't receive my resurrection body until... Christ comes at the rapture. And so that is what that is referring to is that salvation that we will, that we will receive, that will be revealed in the last time, that resurrection body. All right, so we're, we're set free from the very presence of sin and this body of death. Paul referred to it that way in Romans chapter 7, verse 24. We're going to look at this verse, by the way, more when we get into the salvation from the power of sin. He's talking about sin. <laughs> In verse 22 here of Romans chapter 7, he says, For I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man, but I see a different law in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin, which is in my members. I don't know if you've noticed that, but the flesh, this body that we live in, where the old sin nature dwells, there's a different law in the flesh than we have in the spirit, in the inner man. Verse 24, wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? This is a body of death, this body of death, the body of this death. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 49 1 Corinthians chapter 15 speaks to the idea of the earthly body. This is a neat chapter. I almost want to back up and cover a bunch of this. But um, this is talking about the resurrection body here, by the way, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And then what he says in verse 46 is, However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, then the spiritual. In other words, you first have your natural body, 
and then you will receive your spiritual body. And that is, by the way, the natural, if I'm correct on this, this is the, yes, the natural is actually the word sukikos, and it's actually an interesting word because it means soulish. It means soulish. In other words, the, the body that we have right now is a body that's designed to house the soul. It's a sukikos body. It's a soulish body. The body we will receive is a pneumatikos body, a spiritual body. It's designed to house the spirit. Now recognize, as a born-again believer, I have both soul and spirit. But my body I live in was designed for the soul because everyone has a soul. Even unbelievers have souls, right? Souls are in, present in all human beings, unbelievers and believers alike. So this body that we have now is designed to house the soul. But the body we will yet receive, the spiritual body, is designed to house the spirit, the human spirit, which only born-again believers have. Then it goes in verse 47, the first man is from earth, earthly, the second man is from heaven. Because the first man is talking about is Adam from the earth, taken from the earth. The second is from heaven, that is Christ. As is the earthly, so also are those who are earthly. And as is the heavenly, so also are those who are heavenly. Just as we have been born, excuse me, just as we have borne the image of the earthly, we will also bear the image of the heavenly. So this idea of bearing the image of the earthly, that's what we're doing right now. We're bearing the image of the earthly in these bodies. Bearing the image of the earthly. And the earthly is mortal. Right? The earthly is mortal, but the heavenly is not. The heavenly is eternal. And so we bear the image presently of the earthly, these mortal bodies, where we will also bear the image of the heavenly one day. So that's, an, that's a, just a beautiful passage in 1 Corinthians 15. I'd love to teach through that. And we are perfectly conformed to the image of His Son. In Romans chapter 8, verse 29, if you'll go back to Romans with me, Romans chapter 8. In verse 29, you can either turn in your Bibles or you can follow on the screen either way. That's why I put it up there to make it easy for you. It says, For those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to become conformed to the image of His Son, so that He would be the firstborn among many brethren. Now, the idea of being conformed to the image of His Son is actually a complete and total conform. We're conformed completely to the image of His Son. Now, presently... If indeed, and this is third class condition, maybe yes, maybe no. If indeed you have been following after Christ, walking in the light, learning the things of the word of God, seeking after his will, uh, doing all the things that God would have you to do, then you are presently being conformed to the image of his son. More and more and more as we grow in our faith, we become more Christ-like. Now, I'm never going to be Jesus Christ. I will never be Jesus Christ. There is only one Savior, one Jesus Christ. But what happens is, and my my personality will never be eradicated. It's not how it works in God's plan. It's not as though my personality is going to be eradicated. But nonetheless, day by day by day, God is conforming me through the transforming, the renewing of the mind. God is conforming me to the image of His Son, I am becoming more like that. But in, in ultimately, we will be perfectly conformed to the image of His Son. And that includes, right now, Christ Himself is in heaven at the right hand of the Father in a resurrection body. <laughs> That's where He is right now. He received a resurrection body, and He's there right now. And I will be perfectly conformed to that. One day I will have my resurrection body. I will be also in heaven with the Son and with the Father. And I will be conformed perfectly to the image of His Son. We see also in Philippians 3.21. This speaking to the transformation of the body itself. I believe the previous passage talked about it not only in terms of body but in every other way. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. If you turn in your Bibles, you'll find that section. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20 says, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also, also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, <laughs> I the the one the the Teaching, we've been doing eschatology on Sunday mornings at 9 o'clock, and right now we're in Revelation, and we, 
We've been talking about the order of events that are going to occur, and we've talked about the rapture event, and then sometime after that will come the signing of the covenant, which begins uh, the seven years of Jacob's distress, and that's the time during which the Antichrist does all the things that he will do. It's the tribulation, seven years of tribulation. Uh, there are those, there are those who teach uh, that the rapture is going to happen sometime during the tribulation. It's called the pre-wrath viewpoint. It is not biblical because verses like this, like verse 20, let us know that the rapture is going to come prior to the tribulation. Because this doesn't say our citizenship is in heaven and we are eagerly waiting for the signing of the covenant so that we'll know the tribulation is beginning and then shortly thereafter sometime... No, it doesn't say that. Our citizenship is in heaven from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is talking about the rapture. That is talking about his return at the rapture when he comes and gathers his bride. So the rapture will precede any of those things that we learn about in the tribulation. I don't know how anybody can see it any other way. If, you're, if you believe in a pre-wrath rapture, you're not eagerly waiting for your Savior. You've lost that. Verse 21 goes on to say, Who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. So this is specifically talking about the transformation. Uh, I, by the way, this passage I also think has a, a deeper meaning than just the physical bodies because it says transforming the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory. Certainly that has to do with this earthen vessel and the resurrection body we will receive. But it also has to do with, very subtly in here, it also has to do with how the church itself as a body will be purified, made ready for the marriage, right? What's going to happen is the church, we are the bride of Christ. And when the church is taken up at the rapture event, we are purified and made ready for the wedding, and that takes place, that purification, that final purification, if you will, takes place through the event known as the judgment seat of Christ. That's when our deeds are evaluated. All of our deeds that did not bear fruit for God are burned up in wood, hay, and stubble that burns up in the fire. And then what is, what is highlighted in that event is the gold, silver, and precious stones, which is all the things that we've done in bearing fruit for God in our lives, the fruit of the Spirit in our lives, all those things will be left behind, and at that point, we will be completely uh, ready, prepared for a presentation to the groom, that is Jesus Christ, and then the wedding will take place in heaven. So this is a deep passage. I'm speaking beyond just what we, what we have in this material, but neat stuff to talk about, but the idea of being completely conformed to the image. Now, salvation as the finished work of Christ. We need to understand this. It is critical to distinguish between the finished work of Christ on the cross for all, which is completed to infinite perfection, and the saving work of God, which is wrought for and in the individual at the moment he believes in Christ. Remember the example I gave last week of the gift card. The gift card. The idea, if I go out and I buy a gift card from wherever, I buy a gift card and I present it to you and you don't do anything with it, then you will never reap the benefits of that purchase that was made, will you? You will never reap the benefits of it. Ah, the purchase was made, the money was shelled out, the gift card has been paid for. But if you just leave it laying in a drawer somewhere then you will never reap the benefits of the fact that that gift card was purchased. And you can think of it that way. Basically, God has already purchased. Christ did it. He already purchased the gift card of eternal life for everyone. But there are those who never reap the benefit of it because of the hardness of their hearts, because they reject the free gift of God. They never reap the benefits of what Christ did on the cross. So what Christ did on the cross for everyone, has been completed to infinite perfection. That is not the same as what 
God accomplishes what is wrought for and in the individual the moment he believes in Christ. So what Christ did on the cross is, is absolutely required. It was absolutely required for our salvation. And it was done to perfection. But until you believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior, you will not have this work performed upon you, which is the work of God in saving the individual. And it all points to the salvation grace blessings. All the things that are done, imputed righteousness, justification, the baptism of the Spirit, the sealing of the Spirit. Um, just, just keep with the whole big long list of things that we're going to study in salvation grace blessings. That is the saving work of God, which, is, which happens the moment you believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior. But don't, don't, don't get confused. That's what God does at the moment we place our faith in Jesus Christ. But what Christ did on the cross for everyone was absolutely perfect and absolutely completed at that point. Does that make sense? Any questions about that? I want to make sure we're clear on that. What he did is finished. He declared it on the cross. It is finished. It was done perfectly, infinitely to perfection. But not everyone, not everyone will be saved because not everyone will place their faith in Jesus Christ and have this saving work performed by God. And remember, salvation is all about what God does, not about what you do. Now, there is the one thing that he asks of us, and that is to believe, right? To believe. But we've talked about this before. Faith itself, what is the value of faith? Nothing except for the object of faith. Because if you, tr if you put your faith in something that has no value, your faith is worthless. So all God asks us to do is believe. He does everything. Jesus declared his earthly ministry complete in his prayer and then declared the work of salvation on the cross complete when he said it is finished. Do you realize these are two separate, separate things? In his prayer in John chapter 17, turn with me there. In his prayer in John chapter 17, a lot of people don't realize these are two separate things. Verse 1, Jesus spoke these things, and lifting up his eyes to heaven, he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son. Remember, over and over again, Christ said, the hour has not yet come. He said that over and over again. But now, in the high priestly prayer that we have here in John 17, Christ says, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, even as you gave him authority over all flesh, that to all whom you have given him, he may give eternal life. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. And again, that speaks to faith in Christ. And also, uh, also the relationship with the Father that's established. Verse 4 then says, I glorify you on the earth, having accomplished the work which you have given me to do. Now, he spoke this in his prayer in John 17. He hasn't gone to the cross yet. Nothing's happened yet on the cross the sins of the world have not been laid on Christ. He hasn't even gotten there yet. We haven't gotten to the Garden of Gethsemane yet. None of that's taken place. And yet he says in this prayer, having accomplished the work which you, gave, which you have given me to do. Now what he's talking about in this verse is his earthly ministry. His earthly ministry has come to a conclusion. It's complete, perfectly done by Christ. His earthly ministry is complete. Okay, so he did everything the Father wanted him to do in his earthly ministry. Now when we turn to John chapter 19 and verse 30, and you've seen this verse before, but we, we turn to John 19 30. Here we have Christ on the cross. And he says, Therefore, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. That is, to tell us die. To tell us die which is, as I told you before, it was used as a term to describe being paid in full. It is finished, paid in full. The debt has been paid. The debt has been canceled because he's paid for it, basically. The debt has been paid. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. So his physical death, his physical death came after Christ himself declared it is finished. Now, some people would say, well, yeah, but that's because he had to say it before he physically died because he couldn't say it after that. I think he could. Wasn't he resurrected on the third day? 
He could have been resurrected on the third day and come up from the resurrection and said, oh, by the way, it is finished. He didn't do that. What he did on the cross is he said, it is finished to tell us die because the work of salvation in terms of the paying for the, paying for the penalty of sins had been completed even before he physically died because it was accomplished through his spiritual death on the cross. So Christ has declared that it is finished. Not only his earthly work, but his work on the cross, his earthly ministry, but his work on the cross is finished. And the Father, this is very important too, the Father was completely satisfied with the finished work of Christ on the cross, which made redemption and reconciliation available to everyone. He was completely satisfied. 1 Timothy 2.6, 1 Timothy 2.6. T-books are all lumped together in our New Testament. If you get to the T-books, you're in the right spot. Just find Timothy. Maybe I can find it. What do you think? 1 Timothy 2.6. Verse 5 says, For there is one God and one mediator also between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Don't you think it's significant that Jesus Christ is both God and man? He's the mediator between God and man. And he is unique in that fancy term we use, the hypostatic union. He is both God and man, absolutely uniquely suited to be the mediator between God and man. The man Christ Jesus, who gave himself... Why is that important? He gave himself because what had happened in all the Old Testament sacrifices? An animal was brought. An animal was slaughtered. In this case, no. He gave himself as a ransom for all. A ransom. The price that had to be paid. A ransom for all. The testimony given at the proper time. The ransom. That's important in terms of understanding the idea of redemption. Reconciliation. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 19. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19. It says in verse 18 of 2 Corinthians 5, Now all these things are from God, who reconciled us to Himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. So you have been, as a born-again believer, you have been reconciled to the Father, and that's what that's talking about, God the Father, reconciled to God the Father through Christ, and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, namely that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to Himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and He has committed to us the Word of reconciliation so this is the whole point that's what salvation is really all about uh, we have been we have a separation between us and god as individuals that are born in into this fallen world of fallen parents we are born into this world condemned we receive the imputation of adam's original sin we are born condemned uh, the scripture is very clear on that those who have not believed in christ are condemned already we're condemned from birth and so if we're born into this world condemned, then what's the whole idea? We're separated from God. That's what death really represents in the Bible, by the way, is a separation. We are dead, separated from God. And the idea of salvation is that we would be reconciled to God. Reconciled to God. And this ministry of reconciliation is given to us. And by the way, this redemption and reconciliation that we're talking about is available to everyone. One of my favorite passages, 1 John 2.2, 2. 1 John 2.2, 2. 2. we taught through 1 John, all of that material is on the website, we have a CD of all those classes as well, if you want to learn 1 John, it's a, an amazingly wonderful letter uh, written by the Apostle John, it's, it's a letter of love, I mean it's all about love, if you study 1 John and you don't come away understanding that love is an important part of the Christian walk, then, then I didn't teach it very well. That's all I can say because it's right there. You get hit in the face with it in the book of 1 John. And 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1, it says, My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And that's, again, what I emphasized earlier, the idea that we've been given the strength and the power uh, from God with, through the indwelling Holy Spirit to not sin in the first place. 
And if anyone sins, uh uh-oh, that means we have the possibility of sinning. God recognizes that. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And He Himself, that is Jesus Christ, He Himself is the propitiation. Now, that's a fancy word, propitiation, but it means the thing which satisfies. That which satisfies. The propitiation for our sins, not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. And that verse is an absolute slam dunk. There is false teaching out there that says that Christ only died for those who would be saved, only died for the elect. That is false teaching. This verse is a slam dunk, and he died for not for ours also, not for our sins also, but uh, only, excuse me, but also for those of the whole world. And the idea of propitiation is that that thing which satisfies. In other words, what Christ did in terms of going to the cross and dying for our sins satisfied the Father. And what that means is that it satisfied His justice because the justice of God demanded righteous penalty for the infraction of sin. It demanded it. And so since Christ paid that penalty, the Father's justice was satisfied and therefore He was perfectly free to give eternal life to all who would believe in His Son. Um, I actually want to talk about that other verse a little bit. Uh, we'll come back to this next time. We're going to continue to look at more of these things. We're going to look at how the, the sacrificial death of Christ does not in and of itself save anyone, anyone, but instead provides sufficient ground for God the Father to save all who believe in His Son. That's the whole point. And it's the idea of uh, the blood being applied. We'll talk about that next time. Uh, He does not have to compromise His holiness in order to save someone. We'll come back to this next week, Lord willing. When an individual believes in Jesus Christ, the blood of Christ is applied to him personally as God accomplishes the work of salvation for and in that individual. And that's pictured in the Passover when the lamb was slain and then the process was not complete until the blood was applied to the doorposts and the lintel of the house. So what we have is that when Christ went to the cross, the lamb was slain. But the process is not complete because the blood needs to be applied. And the blood is applied to you as an individual the moment that you believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior. So we'll talk about this next week. This is uh, even more information that makes it very clear that Jesus Christ died for everyone, uh, but the actual uh, salvation comes upon those who, uh, who place their faith in Jesus Christ. And those are, those are the ones that God accomplishes the work of salvation for and in. But I want to go ahead and take a look at our scripture for this week, Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. And I mentioned, I mentioned this before, that you can kind of draw a line. I don't have the ability to do that in my, on my software here, but uh, you can draw a line underneath those two verses, uh, between verses 9 and 10, because it is significant. There's a difference here. Verses 8 and 9 talk about our past tense salvation. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result result of works so that no one may boast. So there's no works involved in salvation. There's nothing you can add to what Christ did on the cross. There's no need for anything beyond simple faith. Faith of a child. Simple faith. The faith of a child. That's it. Because God has done everything necessary to, to, make, to provide for the salvation and He will do everything necessary to save you at the moment you believe in Jesus Christ. Okay, so God does everything in this process. All we have is simple faith. Uh, by grace, through faith. That's what it says. Now, that's prior to salvation. There's no works involved in salvation. Post-salvation. Verse 10, we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. You, as a believer in Jesus Christ, have good works that have been prepared for you. All right? That is in the form of everyday things that you will do, ministry doors that open, Opportunities for giving the gospel, opportunities to disciple. And by the way, the Great Commission, uh, the Great Commission that we all talk about, doesn't say, "Go as you go, give the gospel." It says, "As you go, make disciples." That is a different thing. We'll talk about that verse because I'm going to have that as one of our 
verses of the week as well. Uh, the Great Commission, it talks about making disciples. But we are His workmanship, right? God has done the work. We are His workmanship. He has done all the work and formed us into what He wants us to be, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Now, if Ephesians chapter 4, later on in this, later on in this very book... It says, He gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors and teachers. These are gifted individuals given to churches. Today we have evangelists and pastor teachers given to the churches for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. Now what that means is what we are doing here together, I was given as a pastor teacher, I was given by God to this local church. Doesn't mean he couldn't give somebody else. I mean, I'm not, I'm not special in that way. He just, he just chose me and gave me to this church for the equipping of the saints for the work of service. So your work of service is not coming to church today. Your work of service is out there somewhere, in your daily lives, those good works that we read about in Ephesians 2.10 are accomplished in your daily life. And He will provide opportunities for those good works throughout your day, throughout your life. Doors of ministry will open. My exhortation to you today is... Come to understand what those good works are. If God prepared them, and this beforehand is in the idea of before you even existed, in eternity past, God prepared good works for you to do. And if God did that, if it was important enough for Him to do in eternity past to prepare good works for you, don't you think you ought to know what they are? Find out what those good works are. So that you can walk in them and glorify God. Yes, you can accomplish all kinds of things for God in your daily life. But He has specifically designed certain things for you to be participating in. I love this expression. Pastor Bob gave me this expression. He used it in class one day. Why is it that we always ask God to bless what we're doing? Why aren't we doing what He's blessing? Very different mindset. The first, first mindset is, well, I'm going to do my thing and I'm going to pray that God will bless it. Instead, we should be thinking the other way around. I need to find out what God is blessing and that's what I need to be doing. And this is the idea of these good works. God has prepared good works for you. If you know what those good works are and you're participating in those, don't you think that there's going to be fruit born in that? Absolutely. Now, there are ministry opportunities right here in this local church, if you're interested in them. Doors of ministry open up all the time. People have, people have come up to me and told me about things they want to do. There's ministry opportunities opening up outside the church more and more. I'm hoping we can get something going with CEF. That's starting to blossom. We may have something going on with CEF. If you've never participated in CEF, the Good News Clubs, I highly recommend it. An opportunity to sit down and speak with uh, these children and tell them Bible stories, teach them Bible stories. They're prepared for you. It's not like you've got to create them yourself. They're given to you. But you teach them these Bible stories and you give them the gospel in the process. Just amazing ministry opportunities with CEF. Who knows if we may have opportunities uh, to go on mission trips. Uh, one of the things that I've been approached about is a mission trip over to the Philippines. I've got to pray about that. That's a, I was already approached about going over to Ukraine and now I'm being approached about going to the Philippines to help go over there and help teach pastors. Mission, missionary opportunities may open up. You may have doors of ministry that are as simple as coming up front and helping the pastor sing the songs that we sing. There are tons of ministry opportunities that you can participate in, but you have to have a heart that's interested in them. We've talked recently about some of the ministry opportunities that have opened up with Terry back there, with his opportunities to go out and speak to individuals and give them uh, the gospel and talk to them about uh, things and pray with them and so on and so forth. That's a new opportunity, ministry opportunity here 
at this local church. And if God calls you to do that, then you should participate in that ministry. My exhortation is don't just sit back and function in your chair in the spiritual walk. And what, what Pastor Bob, I was talking to Pastor Bob this past Monday. We go to lunch once a month and he was talking about how, I was telling him how I'd been teaching on the spiritual gifts and how that ties right into this. If you're gifted in a particular way, whatever gift or gifts you may have, obviously those are tuned to these works that God prepared for you in the past. I mean, you've been spiritually gifted to participate in those things. And he laughed and he looked at me and he said, yeah, and there's no spiritual gift of pew sitter, Right? Nobody is specially gifted to sit in the chair. It's not there. So the point is, these things that God is opening up for us are, are opportunities for us to get out there and function in our work of service. This is what God has designed for us. He doesn't need you to do those works. He can accomplish them without you. But He provides them for you as opportunities. That's how we should look at these things. These are opportunities to serve the Lord. And they're a blessing in that regard, opportunities to serve the Lord. And He, can, he is going to uh, give you everything you need to accomplish those ministries. That's one of the things we're going to study about. It's one of the reasons I was really moved to go on into salvation from the power of sin. Because when we study on salvation from the power of sin, we start to understand that God does all of the work in our salvation he also does everything that we need as believers to accomplish our works. All he, really, all he really needs from us is diligence and obedience because he's going to do everything. He's going to give you the strength. He's going to give you the wisdom. He's going to give you the opportunity. He's going to be the one that produces the fruit. God does everything. So all the pressure is off. I mean, honestly, all the pressure is off because you merely need to have the right heart attitude. You need to say, well, Lord, what is it that you have for me to do? I mean, that's a great way to wake up every morning. You wake up in the morning and you, you talk to the Lord. And you say, Lord, what is it that you have for me to do today? Show me and help me do it. And he will. He will do that. He will give you the strength. He will give you everything you need. So this is my exhortation, is that you have a heart to know what these good works are that God prepared for you to do. And the last point I'll make is, is, a, is a, a, an aside a little bit separate from this. I think that, and this, this is just something the Lord put on my heart just now, I think that we as believers, unfortunately, we do a great job of building ourselves up and critically examining others. And instead, the right way to live the Christian walk is to critically examine ourselves and build others up. You see the difference? If I'm sitting around building myself up, what am I doing? I'm going to get puffed up with pride, aren't I? And if I spend all my time critically examining others, you know what I mean by that? I mean judging. We spend a lot of our energy judging others. And if instead we critically examined ourselves, like in this opportunity, we examine our own hearts and see, am I really seeking after what God has for me to do? If I spend time critically examining my own life, and I have a heart of forgiveness, and I build up others, that's the design that God has for us. We're supposed to build others up. And this is an area, though, where I can say we need to do, we need to do some serious soul searching, critically examining our own walk with God, and ask ourselves, okay, am I really doing this? Am I re really doing what he's, what he's asking me to do, or am I just ignoring it? Am I just walking along, living my life as I've always lived it and not sensitive in my own thinking at all to what God would have me to do. So that's my exhortation today. We're at the end of our time, so let's go ahead and close in prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, your plan for our lives is truly amazing. And I thank you that you did provide your Son Jesus Christ as a substitute for me on that cross that I might live and that I might be able to live abundantly. And Father, that's what this is all about, this exhortation today, the idea of seeking after the good works that you've prepared for us. I can live an abundant life in so many ways. You have so much for me, so much in store for me. 
if I only seek after what you have for me to do. Help me to see past my own selfish interests, Father. Help me to see the doors that you're opening in my life. Help me to know what it is you would have me to do and the things that I shouldn't do. It's just as important to know where there are closed doors. But Father, help me to be more sensitive to how you're leading, what it is that you've designed for me to do. And help me to have a heart that's oriented towards your design for my life, not my own designs. Father, I thank you for all of these folks who came this morning. I thank you for the joy that I have in my heart just looking out at them and uh, the love that I have for them. I pray that you would, you would help us as a body of believers to grow closer together and love one another even more. And I pray that our fellowship time during the potluck social might very well build that up, that we would grow closer to one another and have a greater love for one another as we spend time together. I just thank you that you have indeed gathered us together like this. What a glorious thing it is to see you at work in people's lives. I thank you for the way you accomplish so much through us. If we only are willing to be obedient, if we're only willing to be diligent, you will provide everything we need. And I just love to see how you're accomplishing so many things through this little church on the side of the road. I thank you and I praise you in Jesus Christ, most precious and holy name. Amen.